You've heard of damming rivers, but what about damming an entire sea? That's right. In 2007, a group of scientists specializing in macroengineering and led by Roloff Dirk Schuling of Utrecht University in the Netherlands published a paper proposing a massive 100 kilometer long dam across the Red Sea. That's 60 miles, almost four times the current longest dam in the world, the Hirakud Dam across the Mahanadi River in Odisha, India. Far from a vanity project, the record-setting megastructure would serve a practical purpose, the generation of 50 gigawatts of electricity. That's a lot. It's double the Three Gorges Dam in China, which is the world's largest hydroelectric dam and power station overall. In fact, the largest operational nuclear plant in the world, the Cori plant in South Korea, doesn't even reach 8 gigawatts, while many nuclear reactors produce less than one. Of course, accomplishing this incredible power generation requires unique technology and design, and it's precisely this design that has drawn both praise and ire from the scientific and engineering community. There's no denying a dam on the Red Sea is an impressive and ambitious idea, but you may be wondering how it could generate so much power. After all, normal hydroelectric facilities are on running rivers, not seas, and therein lies the ingenuity of this mega project. The scientists involved in the dam's design don't call it hydroelectric, but rather they call it Helio Hydroelectric or HHE Power. The idea is that the Red Sea could be closed off to the surrounding ocean, which it only connects to via the Bab al Mandab Strait or the Gate of Tears in the south and the man made Suez Canal in the north. Then, because the Red Sea receives little precipitation and river runoff, it would evaporate away at a rate of about 2.1 meters or 7 feet per year. After some 50 years of evaporation, the Red Sea water level would be so much lower than that of the ocean that the gates of the dam could be opened and water would rush into the sea powerfully enough to generate electricity. At first, this would be around 18 or 19 gigawatts, but after around 300 years and a drop in sea level of 611 meters or 2,000 feet, the output could be maximized at 50 gigawatts. This is even when the rate of inflow is matched to the rate of evaporation, so the dam can generate power indefinitely. Plus, a second power station could be installed at the north end of the sea in the Gulf of Suez. Because uh, the Gulf is only about 70 meters or 230 feet deep, the initial evaporation of the Red Sea uh, would completely drain it and expose the sea floor. Then it would be easy to build a second dam there that could let in water from the Mediterranean Sea. This dam would be even closer to major population centers, so there would be less energy transmission loss over long distances. The 50 gigawatts of power from the southern Bab al Mandab Dam, in addition to a whatever could be generated from a northern Gulf of Suez dam uh, would be more than enough to meet the energy needs of the bordering countries of Egypt, Sudan, Eritrea, Djibouti, Saudi Arabia, and Yemen. As a result, the scientists suggested that any excess electricity could be devoted to energy-intensive industry. A magnesium metallurgy plant could take advantage of the salt brines that would become heavily concentrated in the evaporating sea, while desalination plants could provide fresh water to surrounding desert areas. This would ultimately help compensate for the dam's, well, heavy price tag. It's $200 billion price tag. Of course, the project designers also pointed out that all this power would be completely carbon neutral with no fossil fuels needed for the 50 gigawatts. In other words, it would prevent the emission of about 600 million tons of CO2 per year. But does this on its own mean the power plant would be environmentally friendly? Building a dam this large would be more than just constructing a big wall. The scientists involved were quick to recognize a number of engineering obstacles. For one thing, the Red Sea is a tectonically active area, and it actually widens by about 9 millimeters each year, which equates to more than a foot over the initial 50-year evaporation period. As a result, the dam's foundation would have to be capable of expanding. On top of that, the load on the dam would be in constant flux. On one hand, the rapid evaporation would decrease the pressure, but on the other hand, the density of the sea would consistently increase due to the accumulation of salt brines, leading to more pressure. In fact, there would likely be a large accumulation of brine on the sea floor, which would also increase tectonic movements. Basically, the dam would have to be extremely flexible and made of rather elastic materials capable of stretching and bending. Altogether, the scientists recommended a southern dam at the Bab al Mandab Strait with a foundation of piled rubble and a sealed core a full kilometer wide, more than 3,000 feet, and 100 kilometers long, or some 60 miles 
Mars. It would then have to be over 150 meters tall, roughly 500 feet. The northern dam in the Gulf of Suez would be considerably smaller, but still around 25 kilometers long, or 15 miles, and 100 meters tall, or 300 feet. However, the engineering problems would be minimal compared to the political problems. Many countries either border the Red Sea or would be affected by changes to it. Perhaps most significantly, the project would relegate the Suez Canal to uselessness. Even after a power station were built in the Gulf of Suez to reflood the area, locks on the canals would have to lower ships nearly 100 meters, too much to be practical. Plus, the concentrated brines would be hard on ships' hulls and their mechanical components. The number of ports would no longer be operational, as well as Yanbo, Jeddah, and Port Sudan. Because some of these ports represent important access to maritime trade, not to mention the Suez Canal's economic importance for Egypt, these countries would have to be compensated through higher electricity allotments. Similar considerations would have to be given to the elimination of Israeli and Jordanian tourist sites on the Gulf of Kaaba. Finally, the authors point out that people would likely settle on the land uncovered by the Lowered Sea. In fact, with adequate desalination, it could even be an agricultural area for the otherwise arid region. However, these people would then be in a precarious situation if the dam were to fail. There would have to be an extensive and sensitive warning system. Nonetheless, it's the ecological consequences that would prove to be the biggest obstacles to the project. They're also what has resulted in the proposal's widespread criticism. As scientists behind the Red Sea Dam proposal readily admit in their paper, the mega project would utterly wreck the ecology not only of the Red Sea, but, well, the world in general. The first problem would be the increased salinity of the water in the sea. The water would evaporate, leaving brines behind, so much so that after 69,000 years, the depression uh, would be entirely filled with salt. Because the Red Sea is relatively isolated, it features many unique ecosystems built around coral reefs that develop in shallow water. In fact, the Red Sea has around 200 species of coral, more than anywhere else in the Indian Ocean. These ecosystems are specifically adapted to the current salinity of the sea, as well as the temperature and currents. The dam would disturb all of this. Even if the salinity itself didn't kill them, the destruction of the reefs would likely lead to the elimination of most of the 800 endemic fish species, 10% of which can only be found in the Red Sea. In other words, the dam could potentially result in the extinction of nearly 80 species of fish, such as the Red Sea clownfish, jewel fairy, basslet, and the mast puffer. Perhaps worse than the salinity, the Red Sea would simply dry out. Most of the coral reefs are located in particularly shallow waters, especially in the north, where the water would quickly disappear. The reefs would die and instead leave a layer of toxic, salty soil. Exposed to the air, wind could catch the salt sediments and blow them around the entire region, if not the whole world. This could harm agriculture in countless ways and decrease global food production. Worst of all, despite being carbon neutral, the Red Sea Dam would raise the world's sea level and by a lot. All the water that evaporates out of the sea would inevitably be deposited back into the surrounding ocean, resulting in a net 12 centimeter rise in sea level over the initial 50 year evaporation period. After 310 years, the Time it would take to maximize the power station's output, the rise would be 30 centimeters, about a foot, more than the total rise since 1880. This would likely lead to the flooding of coastal population centers all around the world. While the authors of the paper pointed out that this sea level rise doesn't seem as bad when considering the offsetting carbon emissions, environmental scientists like Peter Bossart, policy director of the International Rivers Network in Berkeley, California, have argued that 50 gigawatts of electricity produced by dirty coal wouldn't result in such a severe rise in sea levels. To assuage these environmental concerns, the scientists involved provided a number of solutions. First, they suggested that the numerous species endemic to the Red Sea could be preserved in aquariums until the sea were reflooded. Although many species wouldn't be able to survive in the increased salinity, some would likely be saved. Similarly, the scientists recommended building the southern dam in the Bab al-Mandab Strait as far north as possible to preserve some of the habitats and provide resting places for migratory birds. They also proposed some more roundabout ways to mitigate the ecological consequences. For instance, the exposed land could be converted into natural parks that could take advantage of desalination plants powered by the dam. Similarly, the money generated by the dam and the high-energy industries it would support could be used to set up wildlife conservation programs in the region. The authors uh, 
the original paper and proposal recognized that the ecological effects would be immense, global, and impossible to predict in their full extent. Nonetheless, they argue that other macro engineering proposals have been accepted despite the same concerns, such as the extraction of natural gas from beneath the water and sea. In fact, they claim that agriculture has resulted in far more ecological change than the Red Sea Dam would, yet we generally don't advocate for eliminating agriculture. Still, most of the rest of the scientific community were not convinced. Critics have called the proposal irresponsible, ludicrous, playing God. They've compared it to the drying out of the Aral Sea by the Soviet Union, considered one of the worst man-made ecological disasters in history, and they cautioned that the consequences would likely be far worse than those the proposal already recognizes. As stated by Peter Bosshart, we don't really understand the effects of such a large-scale project. The intense evaporation and changes in sea level could have devastating effects on weather patterns across the globe. Regardless, it appears that the Red Sea Dam will remain a thought experiment for the time being. No concrete steps have been made to undertake the project in the last 15 years since its proposal, likely because it would involve numerous countries getting together to agree on a project that could destroy the world. According to Andy Hughes, former vice president of the International Commission on Large Dams, which is a thing, the world would have to exhaust all other energy resources before going this route. Nevertheless, even its critics recognize that the Red Sea Dam proposal is technically feasible and all things considered not that difficult to achieve compared to other mega projects. For now, it remains on the drawing board. But as the world's demand for energy increases, it's conceivable that the surrounding nations may someday dam the Red Sea and apparently dam the consequences.